Hello, everybody, and welcome to another installment of Abralin Al Vivo, Linguists Online. Today, at this point, we have Tom Roper from UMass Amherst, a dear friend and collaborator of mine with whom, for example, I worked together on this book, along with many Brazilian linguists, Recursion Across Domains. And that book, in a way, relates to today's theme, which is acquisition of complex syntactic structures and the mental representations involved in this interplay between UG universal grammar, the learning mechanisms that children may bring to the task and the typology of all the complex structures we see in languages scattered across space and time. So I'm very happy to present Tom Roper from UMass Amherst. And I'm also very happy in general to be part of this really wonderful initiative, Abralin Linguists Online. I have to just check the list here of so many uh, sponsors and partners that have been uh, involved in the initiative. It looks like there's not only Abralin, which is the Associação Brasileira de Linguística, the Brazilian Linguistics Association, but also the Comité Internacional Permanent de Linguistes, the Associação de Linguística e Filologia de América Latina, a Sociedade Argentina de Estudios Linguísticos, a Sociedade Española de Linguística, the Linguistic Society of America, the Linguistics Association of Great Britain, the Australian Linguistic Society, and the British Association for Applied Linguistics. So many partners, and I want to just remind everybody of the format. We will have Tom Roper sharing his screen and, and talking with us for just over an hour. And then in the meantime, there will be live chat. And I guess my role will be to curate the questions and present them uh, live to Tom at the very end so that he can sort of answer en masse. And I encourage everybody to keep an eye on the YouTube chat and of course the conversation uh, may just only get going with this talk and perhaps can continue further. Uh, without further ado, let's turn things over to Tom Roper. Thank you. Hold on. I got this right. Yep. Nope. Uh, it's a great, great pleasure for me to be a part of this whole uh, enterprise and also to be have a chance to say how much I enjoy my uh, collaboration and contact with Brazilian linguists. It's a wonderful, vibrant society working not only at linguistic theory and language acquisition, but field work. And it's been a personal quest of mine to bring acquisition to field work and linguistic theory. The emphasis today will be on the implications of acquisition for linguistic theory, but uh, I'm attempting to present things both at a theoretical level and an intuitive level, and here and there at a practical level. All the experiments and things that I'll talk about are ones that could easily be brought into the classroom. I'd like to see comparative linguistics taught at the elementary school level. Uh, there's no reason why it can't be. And uh, if things are uh, not so clear to people here and there, then I just urge you to uh, contact me, we can discuss it. Um, but the experiments themselves, I think, grab people quite uh, efficiently, and there's no reason why children shouldn't be involved in them as well. Uh, Jerry Bruner once said, anything can be taught to anybody at any age in an intellectually honest way. And I've always believed that. Uh, so we'll be looking first at the connections between acquisition and universal grammar. And then we'll ask questions about how grammar fits into cognitive science. And finally, as we go through, we're going to try and elaborate what it means to say that grammar could be an instrument of thought, an engine of thought, not a mirror of thought, and what that entails. Um, so there'll be some technical uh, presentations, but I hope their intuitive ideas will be evident as well, and some practical implications here and there. Uh, finally, I'll talk a little bit about uh, uh, the political implications of grammar, of which uh, the, of the grammar itself, does it have political implications? I'll talk a little bit about that. Um, so Chomsky's famous claim, universal grammar must explain the capacity for language acquisition. The method has been in, in grammar to 
develop intuitional judgments that provide the basis for constructing a theory. Our argument, to put it strongly, is that actual acquisition data is more relevant, more reliable, and often more persuasive than increasingly flimsy judgments uh, of grammaticality as gram grammars become more refined. So uh, the lecture as a whole is urging a stronger integration of acquisition information uh, into the argumentation of linguistic theory. Uh, first, I wanna go to some old ideas and look at them in a slightly different way. The current theory uh, acquisition is accomplished by a child making a series of parametric decisions. Is, does the language have subjects? Does it not? Is it subject, verb, object or subject, object, verb? Um, is it left branching or right branching? Is it context sensitive or not? Uh, all of this discussion has to some extent conflated the acquisition of grammar and the choice of grammar. Uh, it's blocked a little on the screen there. Um, those are possibly two different things. One thing is to decide what are the grammars in your environment and maybe have several of them at once. And another is to decide which of those grammars should be productive. The two processes aren't necessarily the same thing. So let's look at the classic case here, uh, the pro drop parameter. Some languages require subjects as in he ran and some don't. Oops, let me go back a sec. Um, you just say ran. I'm sorry, this has gotten covered up a little bit by the pictures maybe. Okay, and oops, oh no. Um, uh, children at first do both of these things. They say is in the kitchen or she is in the kitchen. Now, what does that mean? Possibly it means they have both grammars. The evidence that there is an obligatory subject comes when you hear empty expletives like there. It's the clue that you have a grammar that has obligatory subjects. Uh, Nina Hyams, who first explored this said, when the there is so frequent enough, subjectless sentences disappear around three years. But what if they have that there earlier? What does that mean? Doesn't that mean they actually have that grammar already? Um, and maybe at the same time have the other grammar? Then they have a decision to make about which grammar they're gonna use, but they actually have both of them. What do we have in the environment of children? Plenty of sentences with optional, sen optional subjects. We do it every day. Seems nice, looks good, going well, isn't it? Did your best, huh? Gets better and better. Take a look at yourself and see if you're an English speaker, how often you drop set subjects, it's quite a bit. Now, is there their insertion? Constantly, a one-year-old kid, he, uh, a, a six month old child is hearing, oh, there's your hat, there's your thumb, there's this and there's that. And all of those there's are essentially empty subjects. So the child has the information for both things at once. Uh, do they use them early on? Yes, take a look at this. Here's a child uh, 1.7 who says their choo-choo train, staring out a window, there are no squirrels. The negative is already a clue that the there is not a locative, but really an expletive. There are no more these. Uh, there be no more. These are very young children. There are no rope here. There's not enough room. We can find many of these examples. So there's evidence not only that the child hears the there sentences, but they use them. Um, maybe they have both sides of the parameter. You could argue therefore that they have multiple grammars right from the outset and they never, they never get rid of the multiple grammars. The problem is choosing what's gonna be productive. Uh, Charles Yang has observed uh, during no stage of acquisition does the distribution of English learning children's argument use resemble that of speakers or learners of pro drop and topic drop languages. That means uh, they haven't decided what language is theirs, but it doesn't mean they don't have those grammars. They have them anyway. Um, same thing happens with objects. Uh, Consider non-adult Adam uh, 2.5, he's saying, take off here, I go take off, Adam take off, take out, I take, want take off. We don't, you, we don't allow in English sentences with particles that also drop the object, but surely, clearly children are allowing it and many languages in the world allow it. For instance, um, Ana Perez and her colleagues have said, proposed there's a default transitivity missing object um, 
assumption by children, and it shows up uh, earlier and later in the acquisition process. So for instance, uh, suppose we have the following picture I'm going to show you in a minute, but I want to tell you the results right away. 30% of four and five-year-old English children make the assumption that the discourse topic, which in this case actually is going to be book, fills the object and they say no. So look, the dog is chewing the book. So Emily, Emily is not reading. Is that right? Any adult will say no, she's reading the newspaper. 30% of the children say yes, because she's not reading the book. This is very common in, pro, in languages with uh, um, what's called a small pro object that can be linked to context like Spanish and many other languages like it. So in a sense, the child, uh, even four and five-year-old children have access to the Spanish setting for pro drop in their response to sentences like this. Um, so uh, here's the saying the same thing again. English, no, uh, in English, you, there's no small pro, so you have an intransitive generic. Emily is not reading any possible object. Children don't get that right away. They retain the other possibility. Um, at some point, they make a decision in favor of obligatory subjects and obligatory objects, and the default is rejected. A variety of factors might be included in this, which Anders Holmberg has described in his defensive parameters, but that may also include frequency of use of different structures. Now let's look at another one, this SVO, SOV par parameter. It's the same story. At the very youngest age, when children first use two word utterances in German, they say ball throw. And in English, they say throw ball. So they've already decided that it's object verb in German and verb object in English, even though German has many uh, SVO sentences as well. Um, I originally thought they would start out with SVO sentences. Maybe the parameters fixed um, before children start to talk at all. There must be a simple piece of evidence in favor of it. However, the V2 rule that's linked to it is fixed very slowly. And both English and German children have both rules in them. Um, the V2 rule puts the verb from the end of the sentence to the middle. Do we ever do that in English? Sure, we say, here comes daddy. The subject's coming after the verb. There goes a the dog. Um, it's also true for he is not here. Here, the is is going ahead of the, the uh, negative. That's typical for German and children hear hundreds of is sentences. Uh, they'll hear isn't, but not, um, and not is. Uh, in German, we typically would say even he plays not ball. In English, you can't because the V2 rule in English is extremely restricted. So the child has to be paying attention to the particular structures involved and actually to how frequent they are. Uh, what happens finally to get the V2 rule correct? Well, the V2 rule involves figuring out what this XP is a generalized category that says something has to go next to it. It allows basically anything in German. Um, and children, you might think, have it right away. They start out with locatives, like there goes daddy, I can sing, but they don't say meat eats bill right away. They don't put an object in front first. They do later on till maybe at the age of four. But even at four, they're not doing it with infinitives. So. In German or in English, we can say to play football is fun. In German, you'd say Fußball zu spielen macht Spaß. Um, but the children will often, in fact, quite regularly put in a das in the middle of the sentence. That is football to play, that makes fun. So what have they done? They've converted an infinitival preposed infinitive into a left dislocating structure and stuck in a a pronoun instead, and they have basically not accepted Fußball zu spielen, the infinitive, as the basis of V2, and converted it into something else. So the German children haven't gotten this rule right, right away either. It takes them a while to do it, and a lot of factors will play a role. So in consequence, English and German kids both have both grammars, but they use them in more restricted cases. The English kids, here comes daddy, there goes a car, stylistic inversion uh, uh, occurs. Kennedy said, ask not what your country can do for you. There's only a few places where we really have V2 in English. Um, 
There are other parameters. I don't quite know how they're set. There's a great, it's a great question. The macro parameters, hot and cool languages, how are left and right branches, branching preferences established? Um, but we can establish they are triggered pretty quickly. Now, what are the conclusions? Acquisition is very early. The trigger must be available, must be innate essentially. Both pro drop and pro, uh, plus pro drop and minus pro drop grammars are early. They need specific triggers. Uh, the choice of the primary productive grammar is structure specific and frequency sensitive and takes a longer period of time. So we have to divide our concept of acquisition into a concept of both acquisition and choice. Now let's look for some more stronger evidence for uh, the role of acquisition in uh, the arguments about linguistic theory. Um, barrier theory uh, for syntax rests on intuitions. Acquisition evidence is actually better. Evidence from Otsu going back all the way to Otsu, but reproduced many, many times uh, in various uh, uh, experiments and actual uh, com communication disorders evaluations and so forth. Complex islands are obeyed by 85% of children by the age of 2.9 or so. They're very young. Where do they do that? Here's an example from uh, Otsu. Uh, there are many more like it. Um, the boy found a cat with a broken leg uh, uh, lying on the table. He found a scarf and fixed the cat's leg with the scarf. What did the boy fix the cat with? Um, now, there are two possible answers behind that with the cat with a broken leg or fix the cat with a scarf. So there are two withs, with a broken leg and with a scarf. They're both pertinent to the situation. If you say, what did the boy fix the cat with? Everybody answers a scarf. Why don't they answer a broken leg? That has to do with a limitation stated in universal grammar, putatively innate, and the putative innateness of it is supported very directly by this experiment. The, the, the pragmatics are pretty equal. You could either take a, a broken leg or a scarf. Children all take a scarf. Why? If we look at the structure of sentences like this, with a broken leg is part of the larger noun phrase, a dog. And therefore you have one noun phrase, NP3, inside another noun phrase. Uh, when you talk about the manner adverbial with a scarf, that is manner of fixing, that uh, prepositional phrase is not underneath another noun phrase. The constraint says, in effect, don't take a noun phrase outside of a noun phrase. Don't take a noun phrase inside a noun phrase, outside a noun phrase. If that's a basic knowledge children have, we expect exactly the behavior we got. The next case is what are called strong islands. This mom didn't know how to bake a cake. She saw a TV program about cooking and she made learned to make a lovely cake with pudding mix. How did the mom learn what to bake? Kids way up in the 85%, even disordered kids, they all say from television. Nobody says with pudding mix. That's where that how could come from. In principle, it could be how learn or how bake. Children only take how learn. If you were to say, how did the mom learn to bake a cake? And the what is not in a separate, uh, is not a, a independent question. Uh, how did the mom learn to bake a cake? You could answer with pudding mix. Um, the children don't do that. Why? Because the what is a barrier to extraction of how. You could say it, it has to go through that middle position and it can't because it's occupied. Um, this is strong evidence for innateness straight from the prediction, straight from the behavior of children. Um, uh, to make an analogy, Mendel predicted that genes exist, then they were found. No one would ever say the evidence that genes exist is because Mendel predicted it. It's the genes that are evidence for genes. It's the early behavior of children who's, who have not been exposed to any training procedure and not plausibly exposed to enough sentences, although there are people who argue that they are frequency factors involved, I don't think there are probably enough sentences that would allow an inference that you can't extract a um, manner adverbial from a lower clause. Um, therefore, I think it's the experimental worth with young children that's evidence for innateness. Um, now we got a new surprise and that's interesting. That's when you do experiment, you get new evidence that uh, pertinent to 
a how to formulate linguistic theory. And so now I'm going to discuss things that we're really still in the process of figuring out. Um, but uh, it shows how acquisition data can pertain directly to issues about the formulation of grammar. Now in the following experiment, um, we get what's called a reality or a truth experiment, truth answer, and children in many different languages and many different experiments have done, uh, have provided an answer of this kind. Uh, this mother snuck out one night when her little girl was asleep and bought a surprise birthday cake. The next day, the little girl saw the bag from the store and asked, what did you buy? The mom wanted to keep the surprise till later. So she said, just some paper towels. What did the mom say she bought? Adults will reliably say paper towels. That's what she said. The kids uh, at this age persistently say a birthday cake. They answer what she bought and not what she said she bought. Why does that happen? Why are they giving us a reality answer? Many people have thought, ah, this is cognitively a reflection of the fact that children don't have a notion of other minds, they're egocentric, and uh, therefore they can only answer with the reality. Uh, it is a rather extreme view that almost says uh, children's world isn't allowed the imagination of things that are false, but the more narrow claim is that they can't attribute, attribute false things to another person. Um, and so this has been, uh, has attracted a great deal of uh, attention. Why do they say birthday cake instead of paper towel? One view is this is cognitive. Another view is that children can't create an opaque complement because they've not been able to subordinate a clause both syntactically and semantically. Jill de Villiers has argued that complement comes subordination could be a prerequisite to false belief or more narrowly reasoning about false belief. So that's an exciting possibility. Um, well, if they can't form a complement, what are they doing? A lot of different possibilities, but one thing they could do is to create two clauses like this. What did she say? And she bought something, what was it? And in that case, uh, you're answering that second clause as if it weren't quite even connected to the first clause. However, uh, so that's, you know, that's where things stood for a long time. However, we expanded our experiments to three clauses and a new set of results arose which forced us to rethink both the syntax and the semantics. Um, here's the critical experiment. So pay attention to it, please. Uh, and if you get excited about it, you could try it out on your classroom or your children or see how it goes. And if uh, you aren't excited about it, but you think it's interesting, I think talking about this with children is a good thing to do. Um, Billy got a train set when he went to see his grandma in the summer. One night, dad said to mom, I really like that train Billy got on his first birthday. Mom was a bit sleepy, so she didn't listen very well. The next morning when she was taking a shower, she laughed about it. She thought dad was talking in his sleep and said that Billy got the train when he was first born. Now we ask the question, when did mom think dad said Billy got his train? We've now embedded the sentence twice. We have think and say, uh, does that make a difference? Well, stunningly, what happened was children started to give us exactly the right answer and the answer that adults would give, which was also uh, not uh, the reality answer. So let's go through. You can see here is the laying out of the possibilities that are involved. And the one that's by far most preferred for adults, 20 year olds, five year olds, four year olds, and three year olds is all the answer to the question, when was when did she think she said she got the present was when the child was born. So let's took, take a look at the different possibilities. First verb is think, that was in the shower. When did she think it? In the shower. When, the, when did she say it? Uh, when was it said? In bed at night. What was the reality? When did he actually get it? In the summertime. Uh, that's not when she thought he got it, but that's when he actually got it. So this is the reality answer here and it's the third verb, and it's not getting much attention here at all. Children are not choosing the reality answer when the sentences are more complex. Now, if we put things to say and say together, when did she think she said, when did she think he said it? It was while sleeping. When did she say she got it? That is, when you integrate these verbs here, we get different answers. So it's the process of integration that is playing a critical role here. If you integrate all three, when did she, when did he, 
uh, when did she think he said he, he got it? It was when the baby was when the when when the when he was the the child was born. So integrating think, say, and got gives us the answer most popular not only with adults but with children. Um, so th they seem to be able to do that. That is an interesting surprise. And when we look at the two clause cases directly, we find they are um, again uh, these children take the reality answers for two clause cases and. The um, three clause cases give us the uh, most sophisticated but false answer uh, when born, when he was born, um, and children have no difficulty with it. So this is a real conundrum, and we felt we have to come up with a different way of thinking about it to do it. What's going on? How could a three clause sentence decrease the reality plus truth reading? How can we explain why reality arises in one complement? But not under further embedding. Um, this uh, and maybe there's a, maybe what we have to do is, in a sense, turn our heads around here. We have to grasp the recursive compositionality over possible worlds. I'll explain what I mean by that. In the generative tradition, all the things we talk about involve blocking effects, constraints theory, islands that Ro uh, Ross has developed, barriers that Chomsky discovered discussed intervention uh, for a cyclic movement. Basically, the whole theory has been built around discriminating what you can do and what you can't do, and um, seeing the modular independence of operations like move WH, which you can do uh, infinitely often, uh, but it seems to ignore everything that it's jumping over, except a few interveners that uh, Ricci has talked about. Let's now try to do the opposite. Let's turn our heads around and add, ask not what can block movement, but what could intervening information contribute or reinforce in the meaning instead of thinking of intervention. So it's a different way of thinking about this whole range of problems. And I'll gonna investigate that, that a little bit now, then we'll find some other cases that go along with it. Um, could it be that a kind of meaning is added with every cyclic move? In fact, we know that a meaning is composed, but how does that interact with cyclic embedded structure? It's not completely clear, but we're gonna, we're gonna sketch an approach. Jerry Fodor had talked about encapsulated meaning. In a sense, a verb and its complement become an encapsulated meaning, it becomes a pivot through which you can now generate another complement with another meaning and go on and do that. So the mechanism of extraction as relative clauses, comparatives, or default to truth, which some people speak of, is more difficult with each level of embedding. So the claim is opacity is stronger if you assign a minus truth to a complement, which itself has assigned minus truth to another complement, with which you could say it's in agreement. I'm not sure what that semantic relationship ought to be. So if John thinks Bill said the earth is flat, John thinks Bill said the earth is flat. That entire two clauses is marked as opaque. It's not necessarily true. But then when Bill said the earth is flat, everything under the verse say is marked the same way. So we now have two opaque complements inside each other. And the challenge is to say how we compute that and how a child computes it. Um, let me back up for a second. So we want to say cyclic movement is a bridge to conceptual composition. It's got to be adding meaning, not just running around the meaning of clauses. And you, there's kind of a prior question here. What's a thought? Is it a series of concepts, but constantly unique concepts? If you say John didn't think mom didn't know the house was on fire, you have a false belief about a false belief. Is that a new concept, a false belief within a false belief? And how do you characterize the fact that it can keep on going? What we want to say, I think, is that the thought has a recursive meaning generator inside of it. And they're not a series of concepts. There is a series of meanings that we can, we can generate just like that. Look at cases like this, and I'm going to give you a bunch more till you get tired of them. John didn't think dad didn't know, mom didn't know the house was on fire. John didn't think dad didn't know that mom didn't know the house was on fire. We say things like that. The key concept here is not new concepts, but recursive and generative nature of new thoughts. Notice that it embeds points of view too. 
So let's explore ourselves first a little bit before we go back to the children. I know you know I know how you said it. I said to do it. I remember you guessed I thought you knew who was coming. You know, I suspected you knew who knew I remembered their name. Look at how many points of view and concepts uh, uh, and, and possible worlds in effect are embedded inside each other. Uh, pay attention, I invite you to do this. Talk to your kids about, it. pay attention to how often you embed one point of view inside another point of view. You might even do it uh, to yourself. You know, when you say, I thought it was green, you are essentially saying, I think now that I thought something different. So you're attributing a false belief to yourself and you can do it again. I thought I had thought I knew it was green. We understand these sentences amazingly quickly. Um, she guessed you knew I said I thought she was late. She said I thought you knew I said what she wanted. Uh, we do this quite easily. And there's some differences between them. She guessed you knew I said I thought she was late. Guess no said thought. She thought I said you knew she guessed I was late. Thought said new guessed. Which one is harder and which one's easier? You can feel that they're different. Uh, one or the other one might be harder. We, we need a metric for how this kind of um, building up of meaning actually work. Uh, you can put it this way. I thought you said she knew you remembered you were late. We have minus truth inside a minus truth case. Uh, subcategorizing a factive, subcategorizing another factive. Uh, I thought you said she, you, she knew you remembered you were late. Not such an impossible sentence to comprehend. The non-factive incorporates factive more easily than factive incorporates non-factive. Thought you knew it was true is easier than knew you thought it was true. That's what I think. Maybe your head is spinning by now. I let my head spin quite a bit the last couple of weeks trying to figure these things out. What I came up with was the conclusion, we need a mechanism and we have it to describe what our minds do so easily. Um, so it, it, sort of there's encapsulated pivots for possible world and points of view. Notice that these possible worlds that are in the false complements involve different points of view. Uh, points of view are expressed through partly through pronouns and things of that sort. Notice if I say, he put my hand under your hand next to his hand, under our picture next to their bookshelf is sit, sitting in a room. You can comprehend all of those cases and they each involve a different perspective um, on a different, uh, a different perspective on the pronoun. Uh, my, your, his, our, their. Um, these are all involved in building possible worlds. So the possible worlds include not only a determination of truth or falsity, an assumption of that sort, but a point of view a dixis, here, now, there, then, pronoun orientation, I and you, the opacity features, true or false. And they also in true, include something you can call question bias. Can't you sing? Um, all of these things get involved in the subordinated clauses. Pretty complicated, I guess. You guys might think this is way out of sight. Um, however, we can represent it as sort of a complement for a, a CP, subordinating a possible world one, a possible world two, possible world three, and somehow these have to be combined. Um, and we do complicated semantic reasoning about false beliefs, as I gave you an example before. Only I saw mom go to the attic, dad saw a skunk go up there too. Dad doesn't know, mom doesn't know there's a skunk near her, what should happen? This is, this is a plausible situation. You could say it to a five-year-old and I think they'd understand. Can five-year-olds do this kind of stuff? What do you think? Um, well, here's a six-year-old. Six-year-old says, I knew you thought, I thought Easter was three days long. So I knew you thought that I thought Easter was three days long. When I think about this sentence, it's just not that hard, but when I contemplate what's really involved, there's a point of view from I knew about what you were thinking, about what I was thinking, and I'm able to put that in in three sentences that are six words long. I knew you thought I thought. Uh, you need a mechanical system of, of semantic embedding to capture something that complicated. Um, is this a completely rare example? Well, I'd like to know. I've been looking for these cases and you'd be surprised. They're more than you would think. So 5.2 year old kid says, I know, I know you knew I did it. I know you knew I do it. 
I thought you knew all about it. And he even knew he knew that I was in there. Uh, that's a six-year-old, a four-year-old. Daddy, guess what? I remember a day when I dreamed of Darth Vader. Whoops. Um, um, four-year-old, one month. Remember last year I knew how to make a two? Um, all of these cases involve uh, doing this embedding from kids who are four and five and six. Uh, we need to research more carefully exactly how much they can do. But the question of whether we are equipped to do this kind of uh, possible world embedding inside possible worlds, uh, there's no doubt about it. Notice what happens when you take a word like he thought, and children do this all the time, uh, it needs to be explored a little bit more carefully. You know, I thought it was blue. Well, what does that mean? I thought it was blue. It seems to imply, I think now that it's not blue, but I thought it was blue before that it was blue is false. So the thought, the word thought introduces a false compliment for kids who are four years old and three years old. Look up every instance you can find of it. Almost all of them have that implication. He thought that the beaver didn't buy any. What do you think is likely the truth? Truth is that the beaver did buy some. That's because he thought that he was a dummy. Is he a dummy? The speaker doesn't think so. That's why he points out that so-and-so was thinking something false. He did that because he thought it was funny and it was funny. So notice he thought it was funny. The clause, it was funny is not clearly true or false. Uh, then the speaker's asserting it was funny. This is a four year and two month old kid. Um, they are manipulating these thoughts very ably. Um, now, how does speaker factivity arise? Let's not uh, pa pick, let's, if John said it's raining, so let's not picnic. Speaker assumes the truth of the embedded clause. It's stronger when it's parenthetical. It is, John said, raining. We can do that for one clause. We can allow the meaning down below to jump out and be treated as if it's true. Does that always happen? This could explain the child's reality answers for the one clause cases, but not the non-reality answers under two complements. So those one complement cases really are outliers, not only for children, but for adults too. Um, we can express this in some technical way. I'm gonna hurry up because I have a lot more to say. Um, and the claim is that you can't, uh, if you said, John said, Mary said it's raining, you don't necessarily assume that. I know, or I'm saying, John said, Mary said it's raining. I don't assume it's raining. If I said, John said it was raining, I can accept the truth of it. So that extraction to a kind of logical form level of the, low, the inside clause doesn't happen out of everything. You can't have a, possible world marker cross over another possible world marker. That would be a way of thinking about it. That solution is kind of a syntactic solution. We need to think a better way of representing the semantics to get this just right. Um, we'll have to see. Now, could we, one support for this would be if we could find another form of substitution phenomenon. And in fact, uh, that will uh, do the same thing. Notice sentences like this, Bill Clinton is the president, John saw Bill Clinton. Did John see the president of the United States? Most of us would say yes. Suppose he says, John said he saw Bill Clinton. Now, if I ask you, did John say he saw the president of the United States? Most of us would say no, some people say yes. It gets a little bit unclear. If you embed it further, John thought he remembered he said he saw Bill Clinton. Yes. Did John think he remembered he said he saw the president? No. You can't substitute Bill Clinton and the president in a sentence that is embedded several times. So the uh, potential we have to substitute words uh, in ordinary contexts uh, doesn't apply when we do multiple embeddings. Let me say it again. If I say Bill Clinton is president, John saw Bill Clinton, and I ask you, did John see the president of the United States? We also say, we all say yes. We're allowed to substitute the president for, the, for Bill Clinton because they're equivalent in meaning in a simple sentence. As soon as the sentences get more complicated, it doesn't look that way. So what have we found? We find that the rules of substitution are subject to the same constraint that we just talked about with false belief. Um, so we now have two, two dimensions where uh, the semantic composition is playing a critical role. Um, so this is essentially an answer to the question that we were asking before. Um, when we have multi a single clause, we can 
uh, go for the reality reading. When we have multiple clauses, we don't do that. Now, um, that's the account of how acquisition can reveal something to linguistic theory. I brought in a lot of intuitions as well, but it is a phenomenon that needs an experiment, needs a good theoretical explanation. And the acquisition data is a very natural route into it. Um, now I'm going to, uh, so in the, in, oh, wait a second. So now uh, the three clause case requires extraction. Essentially, I've made the point that I wanna make already. I'm gonna leave it here so we can talk about some more things that reveal the complexity of semantics in acquisition. Um, the conclusion effect, conclusions blocking effects are not the right paradigm for thinking about these, these results. The accumulated semantic effects through recursion is needed. Are there constraints on recursive semantics? Does anything go? No. Uh, uh, Bart Hollerbrons and I were considering some cases where combining meanings doesn't work. John considers very, Bill very nice. John knew Bill to be very nice. It's an evaluative statement. Um, and uh, it actually can be combined with a proposition. If I say John knew Bill to be a liar, it's both a proposition is asserted, Bill is a liar, and it evaluates it negatively. Um, so we're now uh, allowing two properties of embedded clauses to be generated at the same time. Interestingly enough, they seem to not allow the recursive uh, structure that we're talking about. Um, if I put it in again, John knew Bill to know Fred to be a liar. It's very hard to compute a meaning for that. What, I don't know why exactly, why can't, why couldn't you come up with the same kind of combination of proposition and evaluation that you use in the single clause and simply embed it in a, a, the same clause again? It turns out to be something we can't do. So this, this capacity to recursively build possible world embedding is not completely unlimited. Notice other things of embedding cases with small clauses work pretty well. John made Fred make Susan make Mary tell a lie. It's a perfectly comprehensible sentence. And it uses a similar kind of structure. In that case, the semantic integration is possible, but not in the other ones. Um, so now let's try, we're gonna pivot now and ask whether we can ask similar kinds of questions about speech acts. And the speech acts uh, involve cases like this. This is work built on work by Krifka and, and Rebecca Woods. Notice we have imperatives, questions, exclamations, assertions. Um, can speech acts combine? Are they complex? Think of a case like this. When you say, isn't that nice? It's a wonderful, interesting example because it has an inversion and a negative and uh, it is in fact a positive statement. So it's not a question and it's not a negative statement. It's a positive statement. And we do it all the time. Isn't that wonderful? How and when does it emerge in acquisition? What is the, what is the internal structure of a phrase like that? Well, let's look at some of the similar ones. Negation plus inversion plus exclamative intonation equals a kind of com a command, an implicature perhaps. Can't you tie your shoes? Possible. LF for something like that, I've written it out here. Um, and the logical form for, can't you tie your shoes? The, op the operator would be an ex exhortative, um, but you end up with this meaning, it's called a high negation meaning, where you're um, uh, imploring somebody to do something or kind of uh, rebuking them for not do th doing something. There's some kind of complex speech act integration. Um, how does this show up in acquisition? Let's take a look. Um, bias questions, you'll find kids 2.8 will say, isn't it a man? That's sort of a bias toward saying it is a man. Negative exclamative, isn't it cute? This is very late. Kid says it at age 3.8. We couldn't find any examples younger than that. 3.8, this is a year older. A polar exploration. Can't you point at that block to hear Sarah at 4.4? So this complex, um, speech act is not showing up until much later. Um, how about the ones, uh, how about uh, something simpler? Let's take a look at this one. Isn't that, that, that's a nice one, isn't it? This is said, this is a tag question. 
on top of a, an assertion. And it's said by a kid who's 1.7. This kid is not two years old. He's using a tag question. It stands in stark contrast to the bias questions, the negative exclamatives, and the polar exhortation that we have seen elsewhere. And um, um, how are we going to describe it? Well, you could say it's two propositions with separate speech acts. An assertion, that's a nice one, and a question, isn't it? Um, the tag question is syntactically composed from the first clause, but it's semantically independent speech acts. Now, from this perspective, we begin to have a way of explaining why is it that the tag question can come in with a kid who's 1.7, and these sophisticated questions like, can't you tie your shoes, or something of that sort, they aren't there till three years later. And in between, we get fairly late, at a fairly late point, isn't that nice, which is a negative exclamative with a positive implication. That one doesn't come in until kids are in their threes or something. Well, what can we see all, about all of this? None of this has been done extensively before. So we are in another area kind of at the beginning of researching this. We can see that semantic complexity in speech acts is evident in the acquisition path. We can talk about an acquisition path for semantics in these cases. Um, isn't that compute cute is a complex speech act. Semantic composition of speech acts is like semantic embedding and it has an acquisition path like syntax. Now, uh, the next thing I want, so that is the conclusion. We see all these things falling together. The semantics of embedded clauses and the computation of um, uh, false belief, the semantics of speech acts also showing us an acquisition path. Um, so there's, uh, and the, and the semantics of and noun phrase substitution um, showing a similar characteristic. I haven't discussed the acquisition evidence along that line, but it's, uh, it, it exists as well. Um, and ongoing work is taking place. Um, now, the next thing that I would like to talk to you about, but I'm not going to, is strict interfaces. How the interfaces between thought and grammar work. Um, I'm going to skip it, but anybody who wants to ask me questions, uh, I welcome them. Uh, they have to do with how semantics and syntax are involved in ellipsis. And I'm going to skip right through, but you'll get a sense of what I'm doing uh, when I go through it. Um, it's a difference between open and strict interfaces, where open interfaces involve a lot of inference. Strict interfaces are quite exact. And I'll give you one example. Mary sang that I did means I sang. If I say Mary sang, then I did that. Um, I also means I sang. But in another situation, there's ambiguity that comes in with the, with the pronouns that doesn't come in when you uh, use uh, a real ellipsis. So Mary hated washing dishes, and so I did too, means I hated washing dishes. Mary hated washing dishes, and so I did that too. Could mean hated washing dishes or wash the dishes. So we find the uh, reconstruction of meaning is either very strict or loose, strict or open. So that's what this is about. And uh, uh, um, Chris Kennedy has done the first steps in that direction. Now I'm going to skip all of this because I want to get to, uh, this is, I want to get to, first there's pedagogical implications. You can take any of these examples and talk about them in a class. You can have homework of making them up. You can explore them in lots of ways. Uh, but I want to move on to uh, cognitive science and the questions of whether formulation of um, rules in English and for formulation of rules in, pardon me, in linguistics and language could apply to a domain outside of language. Cognitive science is seen basically as the effort to look at things like uh, language and vision and uh, control of motion and the mental representations that they all involve and say, well, maybe our methods can be similar. Uh, maybe uh, there's something we can learn from each other. But there's a much deeper, more important question that I'm going to pose and give you an answer to. It's again, a tentative one, like most of the stuff in this lecture. Um, could there be abstract um, representations that are sufficiently abstract to cover both language and other kinds of mental activities. We already saw that in the effort to extend um, subordination and complementation 
to false belief reasoning. We're taking the structure and saying that structure is playing a role in the actual thinking. Now we could say, okay, I've got a structure that I'm gonna use in language. Could I use it in some other place? For instance, mathematics. Um, and that's what we're gonna try and do. Uh, we, there's a lot of research on recursion. Um, Andrew showed you the book that we've been, uh, came up with with research largely on uh, Brazilian languages about recursion. And I'm involved in a great deal of it. And if some of the listeners here are interested in it and know unusual languages they wanna research in, uh, recursion in, this is definitely an invitation to do it. We've looked at adjectives, possessive, relative clauses, sentence complements, prepositional phrases, compounds, left branching, right branching, do they have relationships to each other? And let me mention all of the different languages and people that I can immediately think of who have been involved in this, English and German, Spanish, Portuguese, Romanian, Hungarian, Bulgarian, Romani, Japanese, Korean, Chinese, Hindi, Karaja, Wapachana, and Piraha. So we're building up a database that allows really extensive and interesting comparisons on all of these topics. Um, and it's pretty exciting. Let's just focus, we're gonna focus on adjective recursion and um, possessive recursion and math. Uh, at the age of three years, you get kids saying, I have a big little truck. That can't be a combination. It's not a big and little truck. It's a big little truck. So the adjective is recursively modifying another adjective inside a, a noun phrase. It's different from a conjunctive reading, like a big, funny, happy, strange family. That could be just a series of ands. Uh, but if you do set modification, it's a big little truck. You could keep on going and say, it's a little big little truck. Seems implausible that a kid could do that. Uh, it isn't though. Uh, or you could say a second green ball. That's the original work ed math I did combining second and green. Uh, and you could actually say the third second green ball and do that again. Um, so we do adjective recursion of sets modifying sets. Do kids ever do this? Yeah. Adam says a big little truck, this big little golden book, big little baby, big little puppy. These are from two year olds, they can do it. Um, now we did some experiments uh, and I'll show you roughly how they work. Show me a big little backpack, 14 children. Now don't want you to, you're gonna find these challenging and you won't initially believe that children can do it, but they do. If there's only one argument, a big little backpack, it's not so surprising. What happens if we go for something? Of 14 children from four to nine, all got all these correct, pardon me, 14 children who are four years old, 4.9, got them all right. When we went to three level adjectives, it's a little trickier, but four out of 14 got them all. Six out of 14 got at least two out of five, three level adjectives. The cliff shift from two to three is clearly an important one. What are we talking about? Here's a pilot experiment. Uh, a whole bunch of people have been involved in this. Emma Merritt, Dulcie Lee, Austin Taro, and Camilla Bliotto has been working on uh, Romanian in this regard with exciting new stuff. Here is one set of things that, oh gosh, I wanna be able to see what's on the side here. How can I get rid of these pictures? Okay, um, this is what we set up. Sounds confusing. Here's, a, here's some little backpacks and here's some, up here are big backpacks. And then the little backpacks, we find that there are some smaller ones. And among the little backpacks, we also have some big little backpacks. And among the big little backpacks, there's some smaller ones. They're little big little backpacks. And here are the big backpacks. Now among the big packs, there are little ones. So these are the little big backpacks. And these are the big, big backpacks. But among the big, big backpacks, there's some little ones. So these are big, big, these, these are little big, big, big pack, big, big pack backpacks. Um, and this is a big, uh, little, big pack pack. Um, now let's try these out and we find out what some kids can do. Mary wanted A, that's this one. What is that? Oh, it's a little, little no, it's a little, big, big, little backpack. Are you guys getting confused? It is, adults find this confusing. Until children figure it out, they're a little confused too. But many children can do it. They can handle two and three level ones. Let's try this one. John wants this bag, B, and what is it? The child says, it's a big, little, little, little backpack. Now, Bill wants this one. It's C, what's that? Uh, it's a little 
little, big, big backpack. And this one, D, oh, that's the little, 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 big backpack. So here we have some children and I have, I have the, uh oh, uh oh, now I've got to figure out how to do this. Uh, I could actually play for you the tape of this. Um, and if afterwards people would like to hear it, you can actually hear the children doing that. Um, um, so now what's going on here? Um, the uh, range of assumptions here are still evolving. Syntactic structures, hierarchical, it's binary. They send the, the nodes receive labels and they interface with other aspects of grammar and cognitive systems. The rules generating these structures are recursive and they are subject to compositional semantic interpretation. The X bar theory of linguistic theory generates a set of categories. Could that X bar theory, which is built into the traditional definition of how modern um, minimalist grammars are built, could they include math? We decided to explore that question. Notice that you can understand this sentence. There's 112,456, 896. Pardon me, wrong. 112,456,896. We understand questions, uh, numbers as fast as we can say them. If I put them in an and form, it's really complicated. Seven and 2,090 and 400. Even if I said 2,490 and seven, you don't form an image as quickly as if I actually put the, say the numbers. <laughs> Can you hear me? Yes, Tom. Uh, yes, Tom. Yeah, that's good. 
It broke off. I'm very, very sorry. No problem. no problem. Can I share my screen again? Yes, please. Oh, I'm that would really upset me. Um, but hold on, maybe I'll get back in. Let me see. Wait, what's wrong now? Share screen. But the screen isn't, it isn't sharing. Is it sharing? Part of it. Can you please uh, double click on the top of the PowerPoint window? Uh, uh, let me stop share and try it again. Okay. The same thing. Can you, yeah, can you just like maybe click on the. Group? Oh, here. Yeah, good. It... Okay, great. Now we got it. Okay. So can oh, you... Okay. I'm back. I'm sorry, folks. I guess it wasn't too long. Um, so, uh, so we need to look at the math now. So we said that the, um, hold on. The question was whether the math could have the same structure as the grammar does. And uh, we did these things. So now the claim is that the same kind of uh, uh, maximal projection involved in building sentences oh, could be involved please, in building. Can you please put that in presentation mode. How do I do that? What do I do? You're not seeing it? We can see it, but can you please put that on in presentation mode, full screen? Oh, on full screen. Okay. Yeah. Uh, enter full screen. Yeah, is that better? It's okay. Okay, sorry. So the natural claim is that the number syntax might work the same way. And uh, that the children acquire the number system through their understanding of recursive structure of complex numbers. So um, the question is, could they get number recursion through the maximal projections? Yeah, here we go. And this is a description of maximal projections and I won't go through the details. I want to get to the experimental results. Um, and uh, you have a number phrase which generates both a multiplier and a digit. And the digits are the hundreds, tens, and ones. And the claim is that they're going to be the same kind of system. The possessive system works the same way with a DP generating a POSP, generating a DP. And now look at this. Here's the number system on the left, three that's the specifier, the multiplier is thousand, number phrase, four specifier, multiplier phrase is hundred, number phrase is six, uh, multiplier phrase is 10, 60, 3,460, and then nine, the multiplier phrase is ones, and we have that whole array in the X bar system. It's the same system as the boy's friend's hat. Uh, and we could have the boy's friend's father's hat or the boy's friend's father's sister's hat. We could put them all into exactly the same uh, maximal projection system. Um, and that's, if that's true, then possibly learning the recursive possessives or another recursive um, form in grammar could enable you to understand the number system. That's a pretty wild hypothesis, but it's not totally impossible. So we've just started looking at it. Let's take a look at what can be done with it. Uh, I, we've done this in English and in Chinese um, and in Korean. And um, I'm going to talk to you just about the Chinese results uh, out of convenience. It'll take me a couple minutes. Here are the recursion tasks we did with possessives. Um, this time we have a monkey. A monkey has a, a bunny. The bunny has a monster and the monster has a ghost. And this squirrel has a monster and the monster has a bunny and the bunny has a ghost. And I say, can you give a strawberry to the monkey's bunny's monster's ghost? Or can you give a strawberry to the monster's bunny's ghost? And you, the child has to figure out which one is being talked about. A pretty daunting task, but once again, turns out children are pretty good at it. Now, we also ask them to do a counting task. One to 10, 15 to 24, 38 to 51, 95 to 111. Now think about it, you go 95, 
96, 97, 98, 99, and you trip it over and go to 100. And then you have to start all over with ones. We don't actually mention the 10. So we say 101. In some languages, you would say 100, zero, one. But in English, we don't. Then you go up to 109 to 111. Then we tried the same thing with 285 to 311 and uh, watched how successful children were. Many people have done exercises with counting and there's lots of evidence, not only from us, that a lot of children have trouble with 109. The, children, the English children persistently stop at 109. Uh, guess what? Uh, we had tried this out with uh, a bunch of Chinese children, four and six year olds. Um, they had 12 genitive items and those tests that I just mentioned to you. And what happened? Well, uh, this is a list of the Chinese genitives. Um, it turns out that they get the four-year-olds get the two level ones, the uh, bunnies, ghosts, rabbit, and the 50%, about the same for three level ones. The six-year-olds up at 75%. They're handling them moderately well, but there are a bunch who don't do it so well too. Um, now we compared what the highest count number was with the, um, uh, with how successful they were on doing the, the genitive recursion. And it turns out that all five children who could count over 209 had 12 correct answers at least for the genitive recursion. Those who couldn't count very high, they failed miserably on the genitive recursion and typically stopped at 109. These are the Chinese kids, 109, 109, three, four, five, uh, six kids stopped at 109. Some of them could do all of the genitive, not all of them. All of the children who stopped at an earlier point with 39 or 100 or 51 they, or 100, they, they, they all had difficulty with the genitives uh, as well. So that would suggest that indeed, maybe the structuring of the genitive uh, tasks and the structuring of the counting tasks have something in common. That's what we have so far, and it's kind of a promising result. But what I would like to do is emphasize to you the um, concept that uh, cognitive science should be aiming for representations of an abstract level. If they exist, they could be specific to abilities. Visual representations might be specific to visual ability. Physical representations might be specific to physical ability, but maybe certain domains of mental cognition uh, are open to common abstractions with common formalisms. The X-bar system developed for language is a particular form of indirect recursion, um, which can apply to numbers if you do it the way we just did it. And lo and behold, we found a correlation between them. So we need in cognitive science to search for other cases where exactly that kind of relationship is possible. Um, okay, so now um, I'm gonna say one more thing and quit. Um, sorry that I had to speed up so much. My computer failed a bit. Um, and I wanna ask another question because it's important one too. And that is, do, does grammar have implications for politics? Now, the world is full of people interpreting language as a social, cultural phenomenon and they assert it absolutely. I want to look deeper at the actual uh, formal properties of language and ask what we can find there. Now notice, uh, let's take a look at what we could possibly be talking about. Here are assumptions people make about children. First, they're egocentric. Secondly, individuals are selfish and community values are a virtue that arise from civilization and culture and not from biology. The counter argument, if universal grammar is innate and if it has other default assumptions buried in it, then these views can be defeated. I'm gonna to point to one thing. I think there are quite a number of other ones, but only one that I will talk about. And that's pro arb. That's the strange thing of the subject of an infinitive. Um, first of all, notice, uh, notice that children acquire words like everybody very easily. Two-year-old, everybody doesn't like a fan. Everybody gotta go. Uh, everybody in Gordon. That might appoint, apply just to the group of people in front of you, but it also might be a general everybody interpretation. Is there other reason to think about a general one? Is there a general human point of view? Um, notice that there is a that having a general point of view makes assertions transferable. If I say the house is on fire, 
tell the neighbor that the house is on fire and tell him to tell other people the house is on fire is a transferable assumption because we assert, we assume that it applies to everybody, not just the speaker. It's not from my point of view. Claims that uh, every formulation of a proposition is from the point of view of the speaker. Well, propositions clearly have an implication that they're true from any, for anybody, like the house is on fire or uh, the wall is rolling down the hill. Um, now look at sentences like this. Is it good to wear a dog collar? It's interesting. It's an arbitrary pro. We're not saying who's wearing the garbage dog collar. It's arbitrary, but that arbitrary is referring to a general notion of society. And it's actually a human notion. So if I say, is it good to wear a dog collar? I'm not talking about dogs. I'm talking about people. So that hidden subject for the word verb to wear is really a hidden everybody. Um, can children do this kind of stuff? Let's see. Um, there are other cases, it's good to listen to people. It's important to wear a mask. That's what we're hearing every day on the news. Uh, it's an inborn concept of community, that hidden subject of these infinitives. Um, and children can do it pretty early. So if we look at what kids say at the age of 4.9, it's so easy to pick up, isn't it? I told you, it's easy to pick up. It's easy to put together. It's easy to make a ball. I have all these easy examples, obviously, because I looked up easy. If I looked up hard, I'd get a bunch of other cases. Um, kids four years old do this easily. Um, younger kids are using infinitives with the same interpretation as well, I believe, but it hasn't been carefully researched. Uh, a four-year-old who was the son of Brian McWinney, who runs the childess, said, said to his babysitter, you know, we're hard to we are hard to take care of. So what does that mean? We are hard to take care of. It's really, we're hard for anybody to take care of. So even though you're the babysitter, you might have a tough time. Um, so children at a very young age are capable of having this broad interpretation of an invisible unspoken subject category that is the subject of infinitives. Infinitives are in languages all around the world. They all, as far as I know, have this capacity to refer to a generalized community subject. Um, and they are an indication uh, that that perspective may not be so far off. Early Marxism claimed that uh, community was an inborn, inborn property of human beings and later Marxism uh, gave up on it, but uh, maybe it needs to be uh, considered again. So the hypothesis that children are inevitably egocentric and society is self-oriented and self, self is not supported by the formal properties of grammar, such as the pro-arb element. And I'll stop now. Um, I would like to further research on this topic and for field work, for people looking in other languages, how are some formal properties of language um, built in to uh, conceptions of community and society? I think there are a number of cases where they are that way. So for instance, a lot of languages will allow reciprocals to dominate reflexives. So reflexives, John put something on himself, uh, reciprocals, John and Mary hugged. Uh, the reciprocals uh, are in many kinds of grammatical form, but they are different from reflexives and maybe they have political imp implications too. Um, now I will indeed uh, stop and say the overview here in general is acquisition data and experimentation connects directly to every issue in modern linguistic theory, in particular technical issues. And it's important also to find ways to enable the values of linguistics to benefit and enrich all communities. Thank you all very much. If you have questions, I'll be delighted to answer them either right now, or uh, I will look at the questions and answer them as they are uh, on um, the chat, uh, in the chat group. Maybe uh, Andrew has something else to say now, or we can add a little bit. Yes, absolutely. Thank you very much, Tom, for an extremely provocative, clear, and fascinating set of ideas and observations. And um, I'm going to now, as it were, uh, transmit some of, the, some of the questions that came up on the chat. So we had one question that was specifically about factives. Yes. Uh, it was about when you were discussing factives and um, in sentences such as, I know that you know that I was surprised to hear you were coming, uh, whether necessarily these involve possible world 
semantics, whether there's, I suppose, a um, selection relationship syntactically between mm -hmm. the specific verb types, the lexical semantics of the verbs, and the nature of uh, possible worlds that they may that they may introduce, and indeed how that unravels in in, in acquisition. Uh, that's a perfect question to which I. I am perfectly unable to give an answer. Um, of course, that's the question to ask. Should we try to handle this entirely with syntactic uh, features that, that get somewhere? Or should we try to say, okay, what are the larger conceptions that are being carried along by notions of activity and so forth? And yeah, I think the next task is to come up with ways of separating those things out. Uh, verbs like no, for instance, are sometimes called semi-factives. So the class of factive wor verbs doesn't seem semantically well-defined. Words like remember go different ways. So it looks like we need to reach beyond syntax to discuss these things. Yeah. Great. Okay. Thank you for that. Let me see what were some of the other questions. You know, these come in so sometimes in a, in a slightly um, staggered order. How do interfaces, the question is, interfaces strict and open tie in with kids having multiple grammars? For instance, can multiple syntactic grammars interact with the same semantic or spell out interfaces? Can you have different multiple grammars that all interact with the same interfaces? Uh Yes, that's a great question. And some of the, and I've been writing about it a little bit recently. Some of the interesting domains where multiple grammars come to bear is with um, logical form and the interaction of quantifiers. Um, and sometimes they transfer from one language to another. And uh, the, it's a good, really good question whether we have the same free, when we learn a second language, do we master the LF properties of it in the same way? I think there are a number of cases where there are a number of languages where uh, in English you can say everyone knows someone and that someone can be wide scope or narrow scope. And in other languages, I don't know, Turkish I think is one that has some, you only get a narrow scope reading. Now the second language learner has exactly that kind of a problem then. And that's sort of an interface between syntax and semantics which uh, for which there's very little experience and where transfer is almost inevitable. And I think it's a great topic to say exactly at the interfaces what happens. And in fact, Sorace has claimed that the interfaces, I'm saying something quite different from what she has said. She says the interfaces are vulnerable to change. And I think uh, they may be vulnerable to some kind of disorders, but on the whole, the interfaces themselves, I asked Chomsky about this too, and he agreed. You know, he said the interfaces are largely innate and um, pretty inflexible. So when we think about the interface between phonology and syntax, the interface itself, the phonologies are all different, but that the idea that there's a connection between syntax and phonology, nobody argues about that. Um, it happens a little different each grade, but the basic interface is, is completely fixed. And that's probably true for other dimensions too. Yeah. Great. Um, there's another one here, which is, uh, is it an interface problem, for example, between semantics and pragmatics yeah. that speech acts are acquired late? Um, that's a nice question. Uh, and I, uh, I could, I imagine it has, it's interface relevant. Uh, I'm not sure uh, that it's an explanation for that because ah, I know the problem is, I'm not sure speech acts are acquired late. Uh, in whole, uh, kids start out, you know, when they're about, I have a new grandchild and I've already seen his parents saying don't. And the kids can, can understand don't very, very quickly. So imperatives, uh, with expressions like don't, which is a speech act, the speech act of an imperative comes in extremely early, right? Uh, probably the first thing. And then somewhere assertions come in and then somewhere questions come in, but they're coming in very early. Now how they're combined, as the question is implying, that's gonna be complicated just as I was illustrating. And the fact that they combine later on, uh, that probably is a reflection of some interface factors that it would be nice to, nice to clarify. So I kind of agree with the thrust of what the question is, is, 
is arguing, but it has to be modified by saying that very simple speech acts are available to children extremely early. Now there's some question about autism. Maybe an autistic kid actually has a defect such that they don't understand what an imperative is or something of that sort. And they may not also understand what a, an assertion is. Yeah. Um, there seems to be a slight hiccup here in the connection. So um, let me just ask you one question that occurred to me, and then okay. perhaps we can wrap up this session and, and, and again, let the conversation continue. I also have a few remarks I wanna make at the very end. But I couldn't, I would really liked your observation about when it said that I thought X, that implicitly, yeah. you know, it means you don't, you don't, you think it's not true anymore. And I couldn't help but think about the relationship with what the, um, in the semantics literature, I believe, Renata Moussan called the lifetime effect, you know, where if you say, um, Einstein was German, the fact if we have past tense there, we immediately derive the inference that he's the, no longer with us. No longer alive, right. Right. And so if you say, I thought, you know, that, uh, the earth was flat or something like this. The fact that it's in past tense <laughs> in a way is already, I mean, the only reason that a thought should 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 stop is if that thought is dead, if that thought is no yeah. longer true, if that <laughs> thought is no longer with that, if that thought is false. <laughs> right. So it's very interesting to think that perhaps the I thought X construction somehow comes from the same semantic glue that gives the lifetime effect with, with individuals. It's an interesting interaction. Um, um, if you put it in that environment though, um, you know, if I say, I thought Andrew was American um, and but I realize maybe he, but he's now applied for Brazilian or British citizenship. Um, that lifetime effect doesn't apply because you are very much alive. <laughs> sure. So I, sure. I don't know what the interaction sure. is, but there certainly is an interaction there. That's right. There's <laughs> so thank you thank you yeah that's true um well i want to thank uh you tom absolutely for participating the entire abelino vivo program which is extremely rich you know every day it's i'm impressed with more and more content of all kinds of types and the, the amount of participation i encourage those of you who uh have the uh, inclination to do so to to follow abraline on there Abraline official Instagram page, uh, Abraline official, and um, hope that the con conversation continues. Thank you all very much. Uh, Tom, it's, it's a pleasure as always. Thank you. Enjoyed all of it.